I am Brother Charleston Ward with the Grand Avenue Church of Christ. Welcome to all that are able to view us or to hear us on tonight in our Wednesday night Bible class. I appreciate so much uh, you being with us tonight, and we're going to jump right into our lesson. But just before we do that and before I have a word of prayer, I want to say to everyone, there's been several people and members of the body who come up to me and said how much they have enjoyed the Bible classes and, uh, and uh, just encouraging me to uh, keep on keeping on, and I appreciate that. Uh, uh, it's always wonderful when you know that your loved ones love you enough to encourage you and to uh, share their appreciation for what you're doing. So uh, I appreciate you, I love you, and I thank you for that encouragement. And as we work toward heaven together, uh, I pray that uh, as much as I can do to help you, uh, you'll let me know as well as you're just encouraging me, helps me uh, to keep doing what needs to be done. So thank you for that. May God continue to bless you all and your families. And to those that are visiting with us, we want you to know that we appreciate your presence. If you're not a member of the Church of Christ, uh, then we want you to know that it's important to us that uh, you get to know more about uh, why we are and who we are. And even that that's going to be through uh, information sharing that uh, you send letters to the Grand Avenue uh, congregation. And we can make them a part of the Bible class. But I did have an opportunity uh, today uh, and was suggested, a wonderful suggestion by my niece, uh, one of my nieces, uh, that we may even try to do something even a little different to make this a lot more uh, applicable for everyone. In, in a, in a, it's kind of like a Zoom uh, kind of a thing uh, that the sisters already at this congregation are doing. And so we uh, may be talking up on that where we can see faces uh, and people can uh, log in. And so it's just another opportunity to make it a lot more beneficial, a lot more accessible and to have a, 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 a format uh, where we can, an avenue where we can interact with one another as if we were all together in the congregation. So more of that to come, but I appreciate that suggestion from my niece, uh, Sister Gaines, and we're going to be looking at some things possibly in that direction. So uh, with that being said, go with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this evening. We ask you, Almighty God, to bless us as we continue to strive to get the word out. Help us during our time, Heavenly Father, of uh, uh, weather and situations that sometimes prevent it uh, from doing, uh, prevent us from doing all that we want to do. But we know, Heavenly Father, that it's not a stop to anything that we can do. So thank you for the opportunity to, to be creative, uh, to make sure that the message gets out in, in a more uh, uh, possessive, not a possessive, but in just more of an accessible way more of an accessible way uh, to as many as possibly can be there and participate uh, therein. I got my mind and my heart uh, through this lesson tonight that is we presented that it may be uh, presented in a way that it will edify, encourage, and inspire uh, members of the body of Christ and also uh, make curious those who are not members of the church to want to know more about your daughter's son and his church. These things we ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So tonight we're going to just jump right off into our lesson on page number 17 uh, in our books, which is uh, shown to be our topic tonight, will be instructions. Instructions being that we've just come from, we're still talking about uh, God planted the garden, and we just recently mentioned on the last part of that, I made a statement at the end of that lesson that had to do with God makes it easy, man makes it hard for himself. And God had provided all the things that uh, Adam and Eve needed in the garden uh, to sustain life, sustain life. He made possible uh, that they had everything that they needed. And uh, we talked about the rivers that flowed from Eden. And uh, we talked about their names and what the importance of each one was and what each one, well, not what each one provided, but uh, one that was a key one that provided the, uh, the gold and the metals and the resources that uh, were needed. So we know that God made it possible for man to have everything that he stands in need of and he to make sure that he provided um, provides for us as children uh, with the things that we need in order to not only sustain life, but to one day make heaven make heaven our home. So tonight we're going to go into the portion of our book, which is at the last, at the uh, bottom portion of page 17, instructions, instructions. And I'm just going to start out by reading. And then if you don't have uh, if you don't have a book, of course I, I mentioned that some people don't have a book, 
if you, especially if you're visiting with us. Uh, follow along with us in your Bible. We're in Genesis chapter 2 and verses 15 through 20. This is where this is going to take these. These are the passages of, uh, passages of Scripture that are going to be uh, more or less uh, considered uh, during this topic that we're talking about instructions here tonight. It says, God not only placed man in the Garden of Eden, but he also assigned him the task to do what? To tend it and to keep it. In Genesis 2 and 15, the term tend is also translated as work or cultivate. It says, although some seem to think otherwise, work was assigned to man prior to his sin. So it was always intended for man to be working, man to be busy, man to be doing, to be doing something. And it says concerning this idea, it says Tremper Longman the third. Tremper Longman the third. He wrote this. And then these names that you hear, as I've said before, these, these are comment, I mean commentaries uh, from different men pertaining to how they understand uh, this to be written. But he wrote that that means that humans would work even if they did not rebel against God. And he then added, work, which we often experience as onerous and frustrating is part of our creature, created nature. It's part of our uh, created nature. So work is just, it, it, even though it's frustrating sometimes, it kind of like gets on your nerves and you know, you get tired of going in and you get tired of being responsible all the time. Sometimes you just want to go on vacation and just have nothing to do and just lay back in the sun on the beach and just hear the, the water crash up against the shore and hear the, the, the seagulls chirping in the air and, and letting the sun beam down on you with your shades on and smelling the, 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 the ocean, uh, uh, oceanic waters and everything and just being a, but you can't do that. <laughs> and you can't always be on a vacation. We have to be busy. We have to be accountable. We have to be responsible uh, for something in life. But it's a nature of a created man to want to be frustrated or normally to be frustrated or think that work gets on, on their nerves. It said, with the exception of the fruit produced by the tree of knowledge, of the knowledge of good and evil, man was free to eat from the trees of, in Eden. The fruit of that tree, however, was forbidden. That tree of the knowledge of good and evil was forbidden. In fact, the text warned it warned, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. In verse 17, explaining the likely meaning of this prohibition, Grisham wrote, We must not forget that two special trees grew in the garden. The first one, the tree of life, did not give spiritual life, but it will sustain man's physical life as long as he had access to it. Okay? And it says, likewise, the second tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it did not destroy man's spiritual life because repentance and confession to God could bring about its renewal. What it did, though, it was, it caused Adam and Eve to lose access to the tree of life. They lost access to the tree that God said, you can have. You can participate in. You can eat of. And as a result, physical death came upon them and upon the whole human race. So at one time, as I said last week, it wasn't even intended for man to have to die. Man was, his life was going to be sustained forever and ever. You know, as far as God was concerned, Eden was the paradise that he set up for man. And you can live here and, 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 and worship me and be thankful and be gracious to me and glorify me just by doing here on this in this place where I set you the things that I want you to do. But then again, as I said, God made it easy. Man always makes it hard. And so, as he uh, examined man, God observed. It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper, comparable to him. And man's supper would not be found among the created animals. That God created each beast and bird and brought them to Adam and to see what he would call them. At this point, there was not found a helper comparable to him. As Hamilton wrote, the animals are creatures, but they are not helpers. Adam must look elsewhere for his compl compliment. And I like that, for his compliment. <laughs> Thankful, 
I mean, thankfully, God was willing to provide. Okay, now here we go. And we're talking about, uh, talking about uh, woman now. Talking about woman. Section of our own, woman. Okay. Describe, describing the creation of woman, Genesis 2, 21 through 22, and 22, states, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And as he slept, God took one of his ribs, and then he closed the flesh back up in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made it into a woman. And he brought her to the man. She was, of course, different from the animals previously paraded before Adam. Clyde M. Woods commented that such likely, that such likely took place so that the man might become deeply conscious of the lack of a suitable companion and appreciate the mate created for him. So in other words, he put him to sleep that he might become completely conscious, uh, have a conscious lack of a suitable companion for himself and appreciate the mate that God created for him. In other words, he didn't have any, any opportunity to pick and choose what he wanted. He had to take what he was given. And because of the generosity of God, God made it where it was somebody that was compatible to him. Someone that complimented him. And so he made woman. And what compliments a man more than something from himself? He took that woman, took that rib from Adam, closed his flesh back up, and made up that man's rib a woman. Because she came from man. And so she was complimentary unto him. She was compatible for him. She was comparable to him. The creation of the first woman from Adam's flesh is reflected in the, in the admonition found in Genesis 2, 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, as Woods wrote. And what is it saying here? Is that when men are, men are born in flesh and woman is born in flesh from their parents and everything, when they decide to marry, when they decide to get together, when they decide to become a union, they become a union of one. Just like Adam and Eve did. A union of one. And they come together. Just like that. Unseparable. They're one. Even though they're two different bodies, they become one flesh, one consciousness, one deciding factor. One thing in, in, they have in common is that they have to agree on things. That means they have to talk. They have to communicate. They become one. Originally, one flesh, man and woman, again, became one in marriage. It says, from the, flesh, from the first, a high view of the sanctity of marriage is portrayed. It says, we should not forget that Jesus referenced this passage when discussing marriage in Matthew. 19, 4 through 6. Steinman summarized this important section. It notes the complementary nature inherent in the creation of the sexes. Listen now. It also defines marriage as God's establishment for the proper relationship of the two sexes to each other. And that deserves reading again. Matthew 19, 4 through 6. It notes the complementary nature inherent in the creation of the sexes. It also defines marriage as God's establishment for the proper relationship of the two sexes to each other. Marriage is intended to be permanent as the man is united with his wife. And at this juncture, neither Adam nor Eve was ashamed of their nakedness. So when God created these individuals and put them on the earth there was no shame they didn't have on any clothes but they didn't see themselves needing clothes they didn't see the necessity listen to this and this is what I got out of this they didn't see the necessity of any things created by the hands of man because there wasn't anything created by the hands of man everything was created by God <laughs> see that was nothing the clothes I have on were created by the hands of man. Everything that I have on was created by the hands of man. 
But at that time, everything was created by God. It was innocent. It was, it was innocent. It was simplistic in its nature, but it was marvelous in its creation. Simplistic in its nature, but marvelous in its creation. All Adam had to do was exactly what God told him. That's the simplicity of it all. See, God makes it simple. We make it hard. That's what I said. God makes it easy. We make it hard. The simplicity of it came from the fact that he had the instructions, your brothers and sisters. Simply, say if we took a test at school. And I always like these kind, the open book tests where you can go back and at least and look for the answer. You know, it made it simple. It made it simple. You know, you didn't have to cheat. But it was called open book test. This is an open book test every day that we read God's word. Find out what he wants to do. Go off and do it. And if we have to struggle with it, we can go back into the book and find the answers. <laughs> and find the answers. Simple. But the creation of man was marvelous. It was miraculous. It was something that man could not do of itself. And no man can create it or recreate it. No one can. Only God. Listen to this application. God's provisions are always sufficient. And I'll say it again. God's provisions are always sufficient. Whatever God supplies for us, whatever he gives us, whatever he provides for us, is sufficient. It should do. That should be enough. Thank you, God, because he's already given more than what we honestly, really, truly deserve by being those who cause sin versus cause uh, uh, things to go right. We cause things to go wrong. This is true, whether we are talking about physical or spiritual provisions. In this account, God provided Adam and, and the, the ideal environment, the Garden of Eden, purpose. He provided purpose, the Garden of Eden, to tend the garden and to keep it. Adam had a purpose. You remember I told you, told us, I said, every one of us living, we have a purpose for living. We do. We have to take care of business, especially us as Christians. We have a purpose to seek and to save those that are lost. And if you're not a Christian, you have a purpose for living. It's to find out what God would have you to do to make heaven your home. So, but so Adam had a purpose. And it was to tend and to take care of that garden and to keep it. He also gave him a companion, Eve. He left no need unmet. Adam had everything that he needed. Everything that he needed. Thankfully, he continues to provide abundantly for our needs as well. So, God is this continual God. And I talked about that last week. He not only blesses us, blesses us with our provisions and things that we need, but he continually blesses us. He's still doing it. While I'm here today, he's still blessing me. Still blessing me. You know? Thank, thank God. But on last Wednesday, Last Wednesday, I turned 63 years old. I thank God for that. And between the time that I turned 63 and tonight while you're looking at me, I've had so many people say, well, you don't look, you don't look 63. And they were just being complimentary, and I appreciate that. But you don't look your age. You know what I tell them? And I've told everyone the same thing, and they're not members of the church, but I was telling it too. I've told some members of the church that said, but I said, you know what? I don't feel 63, however 63 is supposed to feel. I don't feel like what 63 maybe is supposed to feel like. I feel good. I feel good. I mean, when I was young, I thought 63 was old. I don't feel old. I feel blessed. And I told myself, God is good to me. I'm really blessed. And I am blessed. I'm blessed. I don't know how much, how much further he has for me to go in my age, but he's given me these 63 years, and I'm going to take advantage of it. Yes, yes. And for a good portion of these 63 years, I've been in the body of Christ, and I thank God for it. And I guarantee you, I tell them this too, that however good I look, it's because of him. I changed my life at the right, at, evidently at the right time that I could keep some of this that uh, he created, that he wanted to, 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 wanted to be able to look good and to be healthy enough to continue to tell the world, tell the world about his son. He, he left me here for that, you know. And so I thank him for that. And this is the way I give back. And this is where I show my appreciation is by doing what I am doing here, doing here tonight. So I didn't say that to sound braggadocious. I said it to sound thankful. I'm thankful to God.
for my 63 years. And it doesn't matter whether or not a person thinks I look like I am or look like I'm oh, that old or don't look like I'm that old. What matters is that God is still my king and I am still his servant and I'm worshiping him every opportunity that I possibly can get. And don't get me wrong, I'm not perfect. I'm working toward perfection. I'm trying to get better. I have faults. I have situations that occur sometimes. I have to ask God's forgiveness for different situations. As I said before, I said now again, I am not perfect, but I am working toward perfection. And I know that you are too. But with every blessing that we get, we need to be saying, thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you, Lord, for that. Work should not be viewed as an, as an intrinsic evil. Although some aspects of difficult work are tied to Adam's sin, are tied, I'm sorry, they're tied to Adam's sin, God assigned work to man prior to the fall of Adam. Rather than seeking to avoid work, brothers and sisters, listen, we are to perform our task with resolve. Ecclesiastes 9 and 10. Additionally, we should do so while looking forward to the ultimate rest from our labors. Revelations 14 and 13. He's going to give us a chance to rest from our labors. And the works that we did toward the kingdom, the, 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 the you know, sending up my timbre, a song that we sing from time to time, that's what's going to follow us. God is going to look at us as his servants and say, you did bring, you did, you at least talked to, you at least tried to bring somebody to the kingdom with you. You didn't try to be selfish and come by yourself. You didn't want to just walk around up in heaven all day long by yourself. You wanted somebody to be with you. You wanted to show love to everybody, no matter who they were, race, creed, or color. It doesn't matter. You wanted to bring them with you. And that was important, and that is important to God, that we seek to save those who are lost. This is not a selfish religion as seen by Jesus Christ who gave his life and sacrificed his life that we may have life. So brothers and sisters, as we come to the close of this lesson and God planted the garden, lesson two, then we're going to have some discussion here that I want us to talk about. But I want to keep it in your mind that God provides. God provides. If you listen, get any, don't get anything else out of this portion of this lesson. Remember, the key words is God provides. So, and so when things, situations arise in your, in, your, in your life and you feel like, you know, man, I need this, I need that and everything. But what are we doing before those situations that are negative arise? Are we realizing how God has provided for you to have what you have just right now? Are you content with that? I didn't say complacent. So there's a difference. There's a difference. Complacent means that you feel like everything is all right and you're not doing anything to make it any better. That's complacency. You're not move, trying to move forward. You're trying to stay right where you are. I got mine. You get yours. I'm, I'm good. Why? I'm good. I'm good. You know. Contentment is realizing that God has given me so much. Really, truly, he doesn't have to give me anymore. I, I can work with what I have right now. But if what he gives me gives me the opportunity to bless someone else, I'm going to bless someone else. So I'm going to move it forward. I'm going to pay it forward. I'm going to help someone else. God has helped me. Then I need to go out and help someone else. This is not about me. This is about He. This is about God. This is about Jesus. This is about the Holy Spirit that's in me, that worketh within me and gives me instruction on how to go about doing things. So I can't be complacent. I can't just sit here and revel in the fact that I'm doing good or things that I've been blessed and, and so on and so on. I can't have that mindset of, I got mine, you get yours. It's not like that. Because if Jesus was like that, then none of us would have a right to the tree of life right now. So Jesus, my big brother, wasn't like, was not like that. But right now we're going to go into the quest, to the discussions. And again, I did say, you know, you got your questions there. And uh, fill them out. You know, pick them up. Fill them out. Fill out your questions and everything. And that's good. Nothing wrong with that. Excuse me. Uh, you know, sometimes you get a little runny nose and everything. You want to get it cleaned up. But, uh, so fill out your questions and everything. Just pin it on the paper so you can remember it, have it to relate back to. But I like to go to the discussion because it generates your thought. It generates your thought. You may say, well, it makes it my opinion. It's not your opinion if you're using the Bible and if you're using what we've just recently used. you fall back on that and get the information that you have stored up to remind you about this is why this certain question is being asked. And this is how I would reply to it based on the lesson. That's all you have to do. That's all you have to do. So the first discussion question is this. What can we learn about God's provisions from this text? What can we learn about God's provisions from this text? And the first word I wrote down on my paper, see, I do write this stuff down now. I want y'all to know. I'm going to make it see it real good, but I do write it down. The first word is sufficiency. 
Because if you remember, the author said just a few moments ago, we also know ourselves. And even the scripture talks about it. But God, what he supplies for, uh, for us is sufficient. It's sufficient. Simply meaning it's enough. It's plenty. It serves its purpose. It'll give me what I need. It'll take me all the way. It's sufficient. Food is sufficient. God blesses me with sufficiency of food. Right now in my refrigerator, I've got enough food. And, and when the refrigerator starts running, it's always an opportunity to put something else in it. But I, I like to try, I, I like leftovers. I don't know about a lot of people. If it's good from the first time around, I'll be good the second time around. And so, yeah, but God supplies us with the sufficiency of food, as you see he did with Adam in the garden. There was a lot of things going on in that garden. But he had plenty of food to eat without food with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He had, he had water. And we talked about the rivers that were running from it. That was good water. Clean water. Clean water. Cleaner than the water we drink right now from these water treatment plants that we have here. They didn't have to boil that water in, in, in the garden of Eden to drink it, to wash your face in it, to brush your teeth in it. And not saying he was brushing his teeth, he didn't have to do all those things. But the point of it is, there was nothing that man controlled about those rivers that flowed from Eden. Nothing that man had to do with it. If it had, then we would have had to do all those extra things. But God took care of that. And it was sufficient. The air that he breathed. And the air that we breathe now. It's sufficient. If I'm healthy, and I think that I am, and I pray God I continue to be, I can suck in all the air in my lungs and let it all out. Now, if you smoke cigarettes and things like that, you may not be able to do that. That's why you hear people saying that it's bad for you. And you know, when I, this is not a commercial break, break about you smoking, not to make you feel guilty and everything like that, but you know that you can't breathe as good as you could if you weren't smoking cigarettes or smoking anything. Because it does affect your lungs. But the point of it is, the air we're breathing is free. It's from God. Now back when I was just a little, little bit of kid and a teenager and everything like that, the air that you would go to the, what we call back then the filling stations. You know, the filling stations. They had air. And it was free. You could put it in your little bike tire and go on your way and everything. Now they said charging you for that air. But the air from God is free. It's sufficient. Not close. Close. Clothes I have on my back, that's sufficient. You know, I go and get the size that I'm supposed to wear, it's sufficient. You know, I remember back when I was a kid as well. There was a lot of hand-me-down kind of clothes and everything like that. I was embarrassed about that kind of stuff. I'm wearing somebody else's clothes. And it wasn't always my brother's clothes. It was somebody else's clothes that had been given to us because they loved us enough and loved my mom enough. And since she was struggling and everything like that, and, and, and dad wasn't there and everything, so she seen us little knothead, they seen the little knothead boys running around, and we were rough on shoes and clothes and everything else, and they give us stuff. Yeah, so I wore somebody else's stuff to school, and, Fortunately, nobody told me that that was theirs before I got it, but the point of it is, is that somebody was being nice, but it was sufficient. Knowledge is sufficient. When you're talking about God's word, how to survive with knowledge, the knowledge of science, which I talked about last week, which is good knowledge to have, to have scientific knowledge to be able to create and make things and invent things that are, are going to be uh, beneficial to man's survival as well, his physical survival. That's good stuff. And it is sufficient. But to have the word of God, the knowledge of God's word, is more suffice. It's more suffice. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 talks about God shall supply, shall supply all of your needs according to riches and the glory through Christ Jesus. Now, I... I actually brought my own Bible. I mean my own Bible. My Bible that you know I study with from time to time. You know I have this translation Bible. And uh, its name is Parable Bible. And uh, it has, it's just basically New Testament. It doesn't have any Old Testament in it, but it has New Testament. From different, the King James Version is one of the translations. The Amplified Version is another. The Living New Testament is another, which I use a lot. You know I do, and that's what I'm going to use today. And then the Revised Standard Version. That's all in this in this Bible. So in the Fourth chapter of the book of Philippians, I intended to read it from here out of this different translation just to show you the word, the wording of it because it, a lot of times the breakdown of words make people understand it better and make them take it a different perspective on what it is God was trying to get 
uh, us to see and how he wanted us to, to see it. So the wording is, is just a little different. But in, in Philippians chapter 4, and, and, and it's just like this. See, in King James Version says, and, and I'm in verse number uh, 19. Yeah, verse 19. It says, and, and, and the King James Version says, and it's Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Hope you had time to find it. But it's just this verse, it says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, same statement, just worded different in the Living New Testament. And it is he who will supply all your needs from his riches in glory because of what Christ Jesus has done for us. So because of what Jesus did for us, God's going to supply everything that we need. He's going to provide for us because of what his son did. What did Jesus do? He went to the cross. What did Jesus do? He suffered, bled, and died. What did Jesus do? He took the ridicule for man. What did Jesus do? He bore all of our sins. What did Jesus do? He went back to heaven. What did Jesus do? He made it possible for God to send somebody back to us through the Holy Spirit form to give us a guidance still walking on this sin cursed earth. So brothers and sisters in Christ, we have a spirit with us, unseen by man, but felt by us. There is someone, a living being in us, the Holy Spirit, that gives us guidance and direction. He works through our heart. He doesn't need a full body form like mine to be seen. He works through my heart. And he gives me guidance. And that's another way God has provided for us. Through the Holy Spirit. So, he supplies all, not some, but all of my needs. As long as I'm looking to him for it, as long as I'm using it the way he wants me to use it, I, it's, there's nothing I can ask of God that he won't give me through Christ Jesus. Because of Christ Jesus. Number two says, what does this passage teach us about the nature of work? Talking about these passages here in Genesis. What does it teach us about the nature of work? Well, again, my comment was, God has always expected, as the book says, man to be useful. For one, I wake up in the morning time, sometime when we don't have work. Back when the snow was going on, you're talking about somebody who's kind of having a rough time. I wake up and everything. I'm, I, well, when I, when I did wake up or get up, I slept in long. I stayed up late. Slept in long. Couldn't go to the gym because the gym facilities that I would go to, they were even closed. You know? Don't want to get on the road because you don't want to be slipping and sliding or somebody slipping and sliding into you. It was terrible. It was terrible. But I always woke up every morning with a thank you, Lord. Thank you for blessing me to see this day. And then and my, and my routine for it all, and it is a routine, but it's a sincere routine. I don't want to leave anybody out. It goes to my wife, and then it goes to my wife, it goes to my kids, and then it goes to my kids, to their families, and from their families. It goes all the way around. I have these groups of that, I, that I pray about, and, 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 my, and brothers and sisters, and God is my witness. And the church, my church family, is for sure in that group. Then I even pray for those that are my, my neighbors. I do. I do. Every day. Every day. And then I pray for those that are my enemies, that my would-be enemies. That's what I call them in my prayer. I didn't do anything to, to make you hurt, hate me or not like me, but I'm going to pray for you that you will find the truth and in finding the truth you will find the love and in finding the love you will find me because I'm in here where the love is sharing it with through Christ Jesus and then we're going to find one another so I'm not going to be mad at you because you're mad at me I'm not going to hate you because you hate me because at one time the same opportunity of prep is going to be given to you that was given to me and I don't want you to be obedient to God's word and then find out me who's already been obedient to God's word was giving back to you that hatred that you were giving me just because you were hating me you hate me, I hate you. You do unto me, I'm going to do it unto you. That's not okay. What I want you to see is that if you obey the gospel, like I had the blessed opportunity to and did so, and one day that person out there that hates you obey the gospel, they want to be able to look at you as the person that one time they hated, but you showed them love, so now they see what love was really about. Because they knew that they didn't like you. For whatever reason they didn't like you, that was wrong in God's eyesight. It may have been justified in their sight, but in God's eyesight, it's wrong to hate your brother. It's wrong to hate your neighbor. You have to love your enemy as yourself. 
So it's wrong to hate me, but it's even more so wrong for me as a Christian to hate you back. And so you would get that lesson and say, man, I'm glad he was the Christian he was supposed to be because I didn't know anything about Christianity until I obeyed the gospel. And now see what I'm saying? It all works for the same cause. For the good of those who love the Lord, it always works itself, works itself out. So, he's always uh, expected man to be useful. He wanted man to be accountable. Account for something. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Be accountable. Be res responsible. You know, be responsible. And brothers, if we ever do, the, if when, we, when we raised our children, if we have young men, even young daughters, but especially with young men being raised around their dads, around their fathers, and even if you're a stepdad, you know, and you didn't get to raise your own kids, or whatever it is, or you didn't have kids of your own, couldn't have kids of your own, and so you stepped into a relationship with somebody that loved you enough and you loved her enough to say, I'm taking on the responsibility of the man. I'm not trying to be their daddy, but I'm trying to be the man figure in their life and trying to be the, uh, an inspiring, good, positive role model for them and everything like that. Then there's responsibilities that come along with that. And when they see you doing that, they're going to follow that. You're giving the young boys and young kids a pattern to follow. You're giving the young girls a pattern to look at and say, I want to marry a man like my dad. I want to marry a man that, 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 that's responsible and that is accountable. So God has always expected us to be accountable and reliant. You say reliant? Yes, reliant on him. Reliant on him. It's one thing for your family to be reliant on you. Because they need you to be there as a breadwinner and to go out and work and bring home, bring home the bacon and all that kind of stuff I used to be saying. But the point of it is, they also need to be relying on God, the adults, for sure. But the man has definitely got to be relying on God. The man has definitely got to be the one making those, saying those prayers and, and letting, that child, letting those children see and feel secure. Because kids be feeling secure with the parent even before they feel secure with God because they're learning about God. But they know about their parents. They see you day to day. They don't see God. You have to explain to them how God is seen in the life that you live, how God is seen in the things that you have, how God is seen in the things that they hear and the things that you do. You have to show them that and bring them up in the nurture and admonition that the Lord of the Lord as the scripture said. But you yourself do that by being reliant on God. Adam was to work. He was to work in Eden so he could appreciate paradise Eden. If he didn't work, he wouldn't be able to appreciate it. Anything worth having is worth working for. You don't have to work for it. You give your kids everything. All they're going to ex ever expect is somebody to give them something. I do that. Remember me saying, I used to give my kids allowances and everything, but they didn't get an allowance for doing the things that they were, supposed, were, they were expected to do. You clean your room up, son. Clean your room up, daughter. Do I get my allowance? Well, one thing about it, your allowance is not based on you doing what I have you to do in this house. You know? It's not. But it can sure serve as a consequence for you not doing it. <laughs> yeah. I don't pay you to do what it is. Matter of fact, I don't pay you at all. You understand what I'm saying. And parents, you've probably done that same thing. You give your kids a little something. I give my son money, a little change in his pocket when he was a teenager. So when he go out with his friends and things like that, he don't have to beg for them their money. He don't have to go and steal something because he doesn't have any money. You know. You got the money. Spend to the point where you want to keep. In other words, if you want to have some money when you get finished, don't spend all of it. Yeah. You see something that you want, you don't have enough money to cover it, that means don't get it. And don't be borrowing it off of somebody else. You know, because I'm not giving you an allowance to pay the person that you borrowed money off of. Those kind of things. Those are the conversations that I had uh, with my children, and it seemed to have worked out really good. So, he was put there to work it so that he could appreciate that paradise, Eden, and all its abundance. And it was abundant with everything that God needed to put in it for man. Now in Philippians chapter 2 and 12, and I'm going there in my book again, just flipping right back over. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 12. Okay? And this should be the Christian's expectation of himself. Christian. The Christian's expectation of himself. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 12, simply reads, Wherefore, my beloved, and this is out of the King James Version, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now, much more in my absence. Work out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling. You hear what he said? My beloved, my brothers, members of the church, when I was with you, you obeyed while you was in my presence. Because you knew that's what I expected. 
But now that I'm no longer going to be with you, you do the exact same thing that you would as if I was. Work it out. You're responsible. Be accountable. Be diligent. Be, 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 be useful. Be reliant on God to help you work out your own soul salvation in fear and trembling. This is what it says in the Living New Testament version of it. It says, Dearest friends, again, this is Philippians chapter 2, verse number 12. Dearest friends, when I was there with you, you were always so careful to follow my instructions. And now that I am awake, you must be even more careful to do the good things that result from being saved. To do the good things that result from being saved. You do good things in a Christian life. There are good results that come from that. Obeying God with deep reverence. Be obedient to God with deep reverence to him. Always considering the way he would have it to be done and you follow. Shrinking back from all that might displease him. Shrinking back. Getting away from everything that might displease him. So that means you always have to be conscious of what you're doing, what you're saying, how you're doing it. And if you get in the habit of that, it doesn't become something that's worrisome to y'all. Like, I got to be thinking about this all the time. I will. That consciousness will be something automatic. Just like you're getting out of the way of a vehicle when it's driving fast. You're automatically going to move out of the way. You're not going to just stand there and say, ah, I'll see if that car is going to hit me. You know, dodging the bullet. You know, dodging sin. Getting out of the way of sin. Because you know that God doesn't want you in it. And sometimes the more we do certain things, the easier it becomes to not dodge it. The point is, is once you get it in your heart that it's something that you know God wouldn't love or he wouldn't like, go ahead and get it out of your, out of your mind right then. It's easier said, brothers and sisters, than it is done. But if you go ahead and do it at the beginning, just like something, if it's something is, is, is medically wrong with you, when you first feel that uncomfortable feeling about it and you haven't had that feeling before, you want to go to a doctor and say, I'm going to get this checked out. Because if you continue to let it bug you, and let it fester in you, it's only going to get worse. That's how sin gets us. And so, again, I said on my, I wrote down the note, this should be the Christian expectation of yourself, of how to go about working out your own soul salvation. Don't put your soul salvation survival in someone else's hands. You carry that. You own that. Because they may not care about theirs. They may care more about what you're doing than excuse me, than what they're doing. They may be caring more about the fact that they think that you're not right and they're not right for even judging you. That's why you don't want to put it in their hands. You can't let them make you angry because of what they think about you. You got to keep it in your mind and don't deceive yourself. Be not deceived. You know. So the point of it is, is that you stand for the truth whether anybody else around, else around you does or not. Here's the last one. How is the passage used elsewhere in the scripture to uphold the nature of marriage. How is the passage used elsewhere in the scripture to uphold the nature of marriage? Here's my comment. God put two opposite sexes together and made them one in the relationship and made them one flesh in the relationship known as marriage. So he put the male and the female sexes together, joined them together and made them one in flesh, one flesh, husband and wife in flesh, in the relationship known as marriage. They, too, complement each other. Remember, back when we were reading in our book, the author even used the term complement. They complement one another. My wife and I should complement one another. You know, and the way we complement one another to society is that when we're together, we're laughing and cutting up and having a great time and everything like that. And when we talk away from one another to somebody, our conversations are almost the same. Because we're going to say something at some point that has to do with God. We're going to say something at some point that has to do with the church. We're going to say something at some point to say we've been blessed. We're going to use the terminology the same at some point in our conversations, even though we're away from one another, somewhere along the line. And we're going to compliment one another. So a lot of people say, well, you compliment that person when you dress like them and everything. That's not the compliment that we're talking about as a Christian. We're talking
talking about the compliment of being on the same accord. We're going to compliment one another as husband and wife, Christian husbands and wives. Yeah. And so we're going to compliment each other. They were never meant to separate, as you found out as well, we just read. Never meant to separate from each other. Never meant it. Adam and Eve, they were never meant to separate. Go with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19. And in Matthew chapter 19, all right, beginning at verse number 3. Okay. Matthew 19, verse number 3. Reading from the King James Version first. Hope you found it. Matthew 19 and 3. It says, the Pharisees also came uh, to him, Jesus, tempting him, saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Verse 4 says, And he answered Jesus, and say, Jesus answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning, made them male and female? And said, Jesus said, But this cause shall a man leave. We did read it. Lead, father and mother. And shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, which means two, but they're one, one flesh. Which therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. And you hear that in your oaths, in your, in your marital oaths when, when the preacher is talking to you and you're getting ready to be married. and signs off with that, but God has put together, let no man put asunder. It says... Verse 7 says, they said unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement to, and to put her away? And he said unto them, Jesus told them, talking, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Never was meant to be. Moses a man of God, a man of God, told me and wrote a bill of divorcement and said, if you put her away, here's the reason why you would put her away. But God didn't want that. So Moses did several things because he was a man. That's why Moses couldn't be our savior. Moses, because of the hardness of a man's heart, said, well, I'm going to give you an avenue of reprieve. I'm going to, uh, uh, up to, I mean, uh, an avenue to, of release. I'm going, to, I'm going to show you how to get out of that. And verse 9 says, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso, and whoso marries her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. See? Yeah. So, there's a way that you can do it. But it was never meant to be. It was never meant to be that way. We're not supposed to put our wives away in sickness, through sickness and in health, good or bad, or better off or worse. You know, yeah. Those were the oaths that I remember. Let me read this to you right quick. Chapter 9, out of the Living New Testament version, it says, beginning at verse number 3, some Pharisees came to interview him, and they tried to trap him in saying something that, and saying something that would ruin him. So they tried to trap Jesus and get him to say something that would ruin him. Ruin his reputation. Ruin his influence. Do you permit divorce? They asked. They just went straight to it in this version. Do you permit divorce? And then Jesus would say to them, Don't you read the scriptures? He replied. In them it is written. That at the beginning God created man and woman. And that a man should leave his father and his mother. And be forever united to his wife, forever united to his wife, forever united to his wife. The two shall become one, no longer two, but one, and no man may divorce what God has joined together. That's how that reads. That's why I like it. Verse number seven said, Then why, they asked, did Moses say a man may divorce his wife by merely writing her a letter of dismissal? Jesus replied, Moses did that in recognition of your hard and evil hearts. 
but it was not what God had originally intended. And verse 9 says, and I tell you this, that anyone who divorces his wife, except for fornication, and marries another, commits adultery. Commits adultery. That's why I wanted to read it out of this. That's plain and simple. It's not even hard to understand. It wasn't hard to understand from God's word. No. I love the King James Version, and that's what I study with. That's what I lean on. But when I found some other translation, just because of the fact that the wording was comparable to what the scripture said here, it didn't miss it by any means. It didn't add to it or take away from it. It just put it in a different layman's term. Meaning a term where just about anyone can understand it. You don't have to have a theological education in order to be able to break it down. Then it made me want to say, made me want to read it from this, this version. The last part I want to share with you pertaining to the same thing. That question. How is the passage used elsewhere in the scripture to uphold the nature of of marriage is found in Hebrews chapter 13. And in Hebrews chapter 13, if you go there with me, Hebrews chapter 13. And in verse number four, and I think a lot of you already know where I'm going with this, and then the lesson is going to be yours for tonight. Hebrews chapter 13, verse number four says out of the, new, out of the, out of the King James Version, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. I can stop right there, because we're just talking about marriage, but I'll just finish it because it is necessary to say. But whoremongers, men who chase after loose women, and adulterers, men who do things while they're married, outside their marriage, God will judge. God will judge. Listen to this version, the Living New Testament version. Honor your marriage. First off, you have to honor your marriage. If you honor your marriage, then you won't commit adultery and you won't be a whoremonger. But it says honor your marriage and its vows. Listen to that. And the oath that was mentioned. And the vows that you stated. Sometimes you hear, will you do this and will you? I will, I will, I will. But when time comes in and the rubber meets the road, you don't, you don't, you don't. But it says honor your marriage and its vows. And be pure. That means without blemish. Be pure. That means being innocent. Be pure. That means not being guilty. For God will surely punish all of those who are immoral or commit adultery. God will surely punish you. He would surely punish you. Now listen to this again as we close. He will punish you for doing those sinful things if you're caught outside the ark of safety without repentance. If you truly repent from doing those things, he is just to forgive. If I go out there and I commit adultery and then I just come back and say, God, forgive me, then I'm going to be all right. Nope, that is not what I said. Nope, because just telling God that I'm sorry or God, I repent, because when you repent, you don't have to tell God that. Repentance is done in the heart. And we've gotten so commonplace by coming and letting people hear me that I've sinned and I repented. So you want me to know that you've repented. Hmm. Repentance is done between you and God. Confession is made from your mouth. You want me to know that you have sinned. Some people sitting in the room may already know that you do what your sin is. I may not know what your sin is, but you just told me that you had repented. That's between you and God. Because if you truly repented, you don't have to tell anybody. God already knows. But if you say you repented, then you can have people looking at you like, okay, you've made a difference. Whatever you sin with, you're not going to do anymore. You know. Sometimes we say too much. And sometimes we don't understand what we say when we do say it. Point of it is, brothers and sisters in Christ, there is not a sin except for blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. If you blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, if you have the nerve to say that there is no Holy Spirit, if you have the nerve to say that there's not three in the Godhead, and you're saying, that the Holy Ghost is not one of them. God won't forgive you for that. Because that's almost like saying God don't exist. And if you're bold enough to say God don't exist, then heaven, you don't deserve to see heaven. You don't deserve to see heaven. God does exist. The Holy Spirit exists. 
Jesus exists. And the point of it is, that's the only sin that God will not forgive you for. It's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, but he will forgive you if you were once an adulteress and you repent and come unto him and be obedient unto him for the rest of your human life until your spiritual life in heaven takes over. He will forgive you. So yes, but you have to repent, which means you have to turn around from it. You can no longer do it. You can't even entertain the thought of it. It is no more part of your mind mindset. You remember it only because it's in the past, only because it was something that kept you from the opportunity to be able to see God. And that remembrance right there is what pushes you forward to continue to not do it again because you do want to see God. When you change your mind somewhere along the way and realize I don't want to see God, you'll start back doing the same things that you were doing once before. If you still want to see God, then you're not going to want to turn around and go backwards. That's going backwards. That's turning your face from God, hiding your face from God. And you don't want to do that. So, brothers and sisters, with that being said, I was real um, preempted that right there because I just uh, put my book down. But, so that's all a blessing, too. That's all of lesson number two. God planted a garden. He provided everything that was needed in that garden for all the creatures that he had created and Adam had made. And he provided for Adam a woman. And then with that woman, he gave everything. He, he made it possible that there was nothing that was lacking that Adam or the creatures in that garden needed. And he pleased him. And it was good, as he said. But something happened. Something changed. All of that good. And man played the biggest part of it. And because of the part that he played, I'm blaming it on man. I know Eve had a big part in that too. But Eve has always been below man. Women have never been equal with man except for the fact that they're a help meet. Man was first. Man had first knowledge of everything. And man sinned first. Why? Because God had told him what not to do. And he did it anyway. Yeah. But we're going to find out why I said that. So in lesson three, if the Lord bless us to see it at the beginning of this new month, the first Wednesday in the month of March, lesson three, Temptation enters. Taken out of Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 19. Temptation enters this picture. And we're going to find out because a lot of us are aware what temptation is. We're tempted almost every day with something. But in this category, in this context, we're going to see what pure temptation looks like. All right? Thank you for studying with us tonight. I hope I've said something to encourage you, to make you think, uh, to provoke you, to study God's word, and to uh, write down uh, thought, your thoughts and, 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 and just be willing to share them when the time comes. Uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Let us go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you once more again for blessing uh, us with this lesson and blessing those who were participating in it just by being there, by listening. Uh, we pray that uh, everyone, including myself, which I did, get something out of this lesson. I pray that I will apply it to my life. I pray, God, that it will help me to be the kind of man that you can look at and be well pleased in my efforts as I serve you on a day-to-day -day basis. It will be with everyone under the sound of my voice. Continue to bless them according to your will and your way. Forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings as we see those things that we need to be forgiven for. God, keep and direct us as we go further throughout this week. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Because you've always been faithful and true